Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're continuing with three months of modal logics, a sequel to the 100 days of logic, kind of a logic 201. This month we're tackling deontic logic, and in this video we're going to be looking at the semantics of augmented deontic logic. Before we get into this, this video and most of the videos in this series to come are going to be much more kind of advanced videos. We've already started a little bit when we got into semantics, but the point is that to have a basic understanding of deontic logic, you need to be set or have a really good understanding of maybe the first 18 videos or so. After a certain point, the videos are just going to get more and more complex and you really shouldn't sweat it if you start missing things or don't understand everything that's said there. If you do, that's great. But if you really want kind of a basic understanding of deontic logic, if you can get up through kind of what standard deontic logic is, and maybe even the semantics of it, you would be set and in a very good place to continue in deontic logic. I say that especially because this next concept, the semantics of augmented deontic logic, was a concept that took me a while to wrap my head around and to kind of put into a way that it would be easy for other people to understand. And we're only going to kind of add to those complications as we go farther. All right? With that said... Remember that augmented deontic logic includes the DOA, the double obligation axiom. However, our additional axiom for de augmented deontic logic doesn't hold with the semantics that we looked at last time for standard deontic logic. It makes sense if we're changing the type of deontic logic we're looking at, we're looking at a new kind of semantics. Because of the way that we have used the acceptability relation to define obligation, we're going to have a problem. The double obligation axiom is not provable or disprovable in SDL officially, but we can create a counterexample to it just in standard SDL to show that it's a genuinely separate theory, that it's genuinely separate from SDL. We're not doing an official proof to disprove it. We're just providing an example in which all of the theorems of SDL seem to hold, but the double obligation axiom does not. All right? So we're going to do this. We're going to imagine three possible worlds. Possible world I, possible world J, and possible world K. J is acceptable to I, so oblig all obligations in I are true in J, and K is acceptable to J. All obligations that are in J are true statements in K. And we remember that there has to be at least one world for every possible world in which all of the obligations in that world are true in some other world. Okay? Okay. Now, we're going to try to create a counterexample. So in world I, we're going to deny the double obligation axiom. It's not the case that it's obligatory that it's obligatory that P implies P for world I. Therefore, using some of our rules of deontic logic, we can conclude that it's obligatory that not it's obligatory that P implies P in world I. Okay? Now we remember in world J, because of our relation, we have to have all of the things that are obligatory in I be true there. So we can just knock the obligation off of that last statement and get it's not the case that it's obligatory that P implies P for some world J. From that, we can use implication and De Morgan's law to get the conjunction of two separate claims, which is that it's obligatory that P and P is not the case in J. So it's obligatory that P and J, but P is not the case in J. That's not a contradiction. Many times, obligations are not fulfilled within a world. And because our relation doesn't say that a world has to be accessible to itself, or rather acceptable to itself, it's not going to follow that this provides any kind of contradiction. So then finally we get to world K, where the only obligation we have for world J is it's obligatory that P, so there exists some world K where P is true, where P. Because this is, seems to be a possible scenario, the double obligation axiom is not going to hold in standard deontic logic. Since we can provide a counterexample where 
double obligation axiom is not the case, that means that adding the double obligation axiom would create a different situation where this particular set of worlds would not be allowed. I would require that for a world to be acceptable to I, it must be acceptable to itself. Here's the take-home point, and I, so I want to restate it again. It would require, the double obligation axiom requires that for a world to be acceptable to I, it must be acceptable to itself. So world J could not exist because there would be no world where it's obligatory that P and P was not done which would be considered acceptable to I. So let's take a look at that in a formal format. So for all worlds I and all worlds J, if J is acceptable to I, if and only if for all propositions P, if P is obligatory in I or P is obligatory in J, that implies that P is true in J. World I bears the acceptability relation to world J if and only if for all propositions P, P being obligatory in I or J implies it is true in J. Note, all we've added is that or obligatory P in J or at J to our definition. This is going to be kind of our A plus relationship, and it's only going to be for our augmented deontic logic. Up next, we're going to, once again, take a step farther. Like I said, with all of these videos to follow, these are kind of extra videos, bonus videos, extra credit videos almost, because they're going to get more and more complicated. But if you've been on board so far and you're liking what you see, let's keep going into Andersonian Kangarian reduction. Watch this video and more here at Carnades.org and a new video every single day for 100 days on modal logics. Stay skeptical, everybody.